Hello and welcome everyone to the Riverfront Red Show. This is episode number 519 of the world's most dangerous podcast where we discuss the Cincinnati Reds and occasionally Eddie Taubensey. I'm your host, Nate Dawson, and with me this week, some guy you might recognize, Chad Dawson. Chad, how are you? Who am I? Why am I here? <laughs> we may never know. We certainly don't want the answer. Also with us this week is a guy that um, familiar with regular listeners of the show, um, one of our Patreon family members for a long time, but someone that has uh, been active in the greater Ohio community and has some exciting things on his plate. Um, I'm very, very thrilled to get to sit down and talk to Seth Shaner this week. Seth, how are you? Nate, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. Uh, before we go further and get into the nitty gritty, please uh, head over to YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Give us those subscribes, those likes, those follows. We are closing in on a thousand subscribers on YouTube, and that's pretty dope. So appreciate every single one of y'all. Also, the show would quite literally not be possible without the support of our Patreon family. So if you want to dive a little bit deeper, um, get to know some really righteous folks and maybe get some rewards in the process, why not join us over there at patreon.com slash riverfrontcincy or click the link in the show notes. All right, gentlemen, let's get started by introducing the world to Seth. Um, there is a very specific reason we have Mr. Shaner on this podcast today, and that is to um, sort of introduce what you may have noticed in your podcast feeds on Tuesday morning. Seth has launched a new podcast called Red Leg Roundtable. His inaugural episode featured Eddie Taubensy in, in about an hour-long interview that was uh, far superior to any content I have ever created and ever will create. I'm only mildly okay with that. So we decided to, um, you know, if you can't beat him, join him. And uh, as Seth, if he'd be okay joining up with the Riverfront family, and here he is. So Seth, if you don't mind, just take a second. Um, tell the folks about yourself and, you know, about your podcast. Well, like Bob Euchre said in Major League, those broadcast classes are really starting to pay off. So, uh, <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I just – last spring I launched a podcast here in Columbus locally for the uh, the company I'm working for, the Clintonville Spotlight and the Worthington Spotlight, two communities here in Columbus, and that's called Spotlight on Stories. And I was literally about to launch that when – I heard that you had basically brought on late night reds and we're, you know, it was the dawn of, you know, the spring, I guess. And, and, and it just hit me right then. I thought, well, you know, we could have, there, there could be an interview show with the reds and certainly you never know who you're going to be able to get. You don't know who, who, and, and what the topic might be, but, but my basic premise on spotlight on stories and now red leg round table is let's tell the story of the person that we're talking to whether it be a former player, former employee, perhaps a broadcaster. Um, I, I've even got, I'm, I'm saving it hopefully for um, around opening day or around Father's Day. I'd love to talk to my grandfather. He's turning 88, um, just this, actually just turned 88 this past weekend and and get his memories of going to Crosley Field and, and those kind of things. So I want to tell the story of the Reds through the the people that we're going to talk to and Eddie was great. And this is 25 years since the 1999 team that it hit me just right because I was in college up in Columbus. My college roommates family had season tickets for their company. We would run down to Cincinnati. I mean, you know, 10, 12 times that summer. And um, just that team just grabbed a hold of me. And it's, it's what makes being a fan of a team great. And I know we want to win world series. We want to go to the playoffs. I I'm right with you guys, but, but the journey of that season grab me even more than 90 or 95 partially because of where I was age wise. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited is that despite what we harp on here all the time, which is, uh, you know, the Castellinis and the, you know, what we would call the, the malpractice of the front office, this team has given us so many stories and it's so important to so many people that having, having an, a spotlight on that to steal your own term is something that we have not um, really been able to do enough of, I think. And we're just super pumped to have you on board. Well, and, and Chad, I've been listening to you since 2015, 2016, around in there. I know you've been doing it even longer than that. But your show, this show we're on right now, uh, is very informative. It's very, you know, the pulse of the fan base, in my opinion. And uh, I just, I'm honored, honored to be a part of it right now. 
Well, yes. I need you to keep saying uh, nice things about me. That's the only uh, only writer. Well, you're, looking a, you're looking a little Clooney esque right now with the salt and pepper beard and and the red hat pulled down. That's uh, you know. There you go. I tell you what, he's earned, he's earning his keep, right? I'm telling you that right now. A plus in the assignment. So, uh, Seth, what sort of um, inspired you to get into media? I know you've got a bit of a a pass with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't joking when I, I was joking about the broadcast school. I went to Ohio State as a journalism major, a broadcast journalism major. Um, I was able to, as a sophomore, somehow become co-sports director of the student radio station. And we called the 1998 Ohio State football team that won the Sugar Bowl. We, we, we called the Sugar Bowl. We went down to New Orleans and called that game. I was um, broadcasting. I was the lead broadcaster for the Ohio State basketball team that year that went to the Final Four in 99 um, down in Tampa, at, well, St. Pete in the, in the Tropicana Field Dome. Um, I was able to do that at a younger age, and, and I did that for three years at school. And then um, – you fall in love, certain things happen. You, your wife has a nice, uh, a big city job. I couldn't just go around to the tiny little radio stations and start that climb. So I became more, I became a sports writer mm -hmm. and I did that uh, full time for 12 years. So um, that's kind of my background Ohio State sports, then high school sports, and uh, always the love for the Reds, though. And uh, I, I squeezed in some Red stories here, there. Tom Shern, I don't know if you guys remember him. He came up in the mid 2000s, kind of a, a a, a late bloomer type situation where he earned his way to the big league team. Um, he's from Columbus. So I got to write you know, the story about him, went down in Louisville, went down and talked to him. And um, those kind of stories popped up every once in a while. But, but yeah, even in college, I was, I was in broadcasting and it's funny now with calling high school games and, and doing this and doing my other podcasts, I'm doing more broadcasting now than, <laughs> than I have in the last 25 years. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about your spotlight on stories podcast is how it's not just players we're not only talking about the flashy names that everybody knows there's mm -hmm. so many other ingredients to to the to the stew i guess and you're going to bring us a lot of that you talked about bringing your grandfather on for a father's day episode but i'm excited just to sort of peel back the curtains a little bit and have you talk to uh you know some of these people that don't get a chance to really have that platform a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can tell Eddie Tobbins, he was so thrilled to be having yeah. a conversation about his career. It, it was really pretty cool. And as we talked about in the show, his, his son plays college ball, college baseball down in, in Greenville, South Carolina. And he's in his, he's a, a, a volunteer assistant coach for that team. And, uh, you know, I don't know Eddie. I ran into him one year at spring training said hi, but other than that, I don't know him. Um, but I was able to track them down and get a hold of them. And I'm telling you, it was like December 23rd. I'm here with my family, Christmas time, all that. I get a text message. Hey, Seth, it's Eddie Tobinsy. I'd like to do the show. I'm like, whoa, okay, <laughs> let's do it. And I said, hey, you know, let's get through Christmas here. I, you know, I didn't want to act too eager. <laughs> but I said, let's get through Christmas here and we'll talk about it. And we may do it the new year. And here we are. That's really, really cool. And uh, I cannot encourage people to go back and listen to it enough. We threw it up on our YouTube channel, but it was an audio only. Um, there will be video going forward. So go back and check that out. You can find that on the Riverfront, um, you know, wherever your whatever podcast app you listen to. And I just can't say enough how great it was. Now, we did have a viewer mail question that uh, I figured made more sense to answer now than later. Is from our friend Joey Gadisa. He said, uh, really enjoyed that Eddie interview, Seth. Any more gems up your sleeve? Well, Seth, do you have any more gems up your sleeve? I, I actually have uh, semi-confirmation and confirmation on two or three more, but the one I got that it is actually scheduled um, next week, I'm going to talk to Scott Hattieberg. So that should be a good one. I, I, look, we all probably, or most of us, I guess, wanted Joey Votto to make the team on opening day in 2008. But Scott Hattieberg's 2006 and seven seasons were, were pretty solid. And, uh, and and I have fond memories. That 2006 team, remember, they added Bronson Arroyo, David Ross, and Brandon Phillips along with him. So, I mean, that was a kind of a core group for those next three or four years. And, and so certainly getting to talk to him will be a big deal. Did y'all see there was something on Twitter where somebody asked who the uh, face of the Reds franchise was going to be going forward now that – no, or who would have been the face of the franchise? Like Joey Votto or 
I don't remember the context, but Joey actually commented on it and said, I would choose Scott Hatterberg. He had a really nice face. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> Good timing there. Well, Seth, thank you so much for coming on today. And uh, we're pumped to have you on there, man. It's going to be a lot of really great content, content, and we're excited to get that out to the listeners. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right. You guys want to get into some news of the week? Absolutely. Please. All right, moving on, because there was no news this week. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. This has been episode. <laughs> no, there was a little bit, so we, uh, we we owe it to everyone to touch on it. For me, the big one, the one that, like, literally, my wife was like, why are you smiling like a little weirdo? We haven't been married that long. She doesn't get it yet. because I just found out that spring training dates have been confirmed. That's true. We know. So uh, Valentine's Day slash the day that uh, Chad Dotson up there, I'm um, legally married, my wife and I, is now the, uh, those are the, Second and third most important things happening on that date this year. Uh, February 14th is when pitchers and catchers will report for spring training. We have uh, February 19th for the full squads. I don't know about you guys. I want to hear about it. I think this is the most excited I've been for a spring training in as long as I can remember. Chad, give me a one to ten. Are you pumped? Are you are you are you you getting reserved about this? How are you feeling going? I'm a little reserved, but I mean, it's a compared to the last, I don't know, five or six spring trains. It's a 10 in comparison, <laughs> certainly. Um, no, I mean, I think it's going to be a really interesting spring in a lot of ways. You know, I'm going to be watching mostly to uh, praying for health, that everyone kind of stays healthy and is ready to, to answer the, the bell when the opening day gets here because uh, the Reds do have more depth. Uh, right now as it stands, but it's not unlimited depth. And I, I really want to see the team get out to a, to a fast start this year. So I'm going to be interested to see what um, the pitching looks like, uh, how, how some of these guys uh, are hopefully again, it's health Nick Lodolo, you know um, that's, uh, that's a big one for me. Hunter green. Is he, is he going to take a step forward to, to be that ace that we want? So uh, lots of questions, but unlike previous years, uh, the questions aren't um, – they're different types of questions than yeah. we're asking uh, in spring training. And so, yeah, yeah, I think it's exciting. I'm, uh, I, I, tried to, I tried to kind of downplay it a little bit there. But, no, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a – you know, we always say hope springs eternal. I don't always say everybody says that. But uh, this year, I mean, you know, really, we legitimately have some hope for something, and I'll take it. I love it. Seth, how you feeling? I think it's the depth overall. And you mentioned injuries. Certainly, we we don't want any of those. We're probably going to see one here or there. Um, but but it's really the depth that they have compared to last year. And you think about, and I know that that twelve game winning streak. But the the idea of them having a winning record last year, and there were times when it's like who who's pitching, um, and and I mean just the way it looks sometimes. It was really, I mean, we were excited because they were a semi competitive team at that time, but. But boy, this depth right now, uh, it looks way better in the pitching. So I, I'm excited about that part of it. And then sky's the limit for Matt McLean and Ellie De La Cruz and those guys. Yeah, that, that, that depth word is the reason I'm so excited about this season. This is the deepest Reds team I can remember in a long time, pretty much across the board, except for maybe the uh, position group that we're going to talk about a little bit later today. But they're young. They're exciting. Um, if they're healthy, I think that uh, you know, they could take advantage of a potentially weekend L Central and be right in the thick of things all season long. I can't wait to talk about it with you guys. Now, as far as other news, the Reds signed some international prospects. The uh, annual international draft happened since we last recorded. Um, the big names for the Reds this year were uh, – there are two in particular. One, Adolfo Sanchez, who was the uh, – I guess depending on how you looked at the rankings, they had him fifth overall – which was sort of like based on how much they projected them to get their signing bonus. But he's a six foot, 270 pound outfielder out of the Dominican Republic. Um, some people were saying he is the, uh, he could end up being the best hitter in the draft and seems like the kind of guy that's going to hit at a high average no matter what. But can he uh, add a little power? I don't know. Um, these guys are so young that. It's hard to project. You can get excited about it, but we're not going to see these guys for several years. The other guy, Nibel Mariano, uh, this might shock y'all, but he was a he was a shortstop. <laughs> Nick Carl loves seeing some shortstops. So um, scouts were raving about his work ethic. So I guess that's pretty cool. Another potential five tool guy. But for me, the reason I wanted to bring this up and kind of have a discussion with y'all about it was uh, the Reds have had some notable international signings over the years. The one that jumped out to me were you know, Johnny Cueto, Maricides um, Aquino, Ellie De La Cruz, 
It's pretty big, uh, pretty big deal. One of these drafts. Who are some of the guys maybe that have jumped out to y'all over the years, or is there anybody that stands out in particular? We'll start with you, Seth. Juan Duran. Oh mm-hmm. wait, you want to you want guys that panned out? Um, <laughs> Rude. <laughs> no, I mean I, I was thinking about obviously Aroldis uh, Chapman and Raziel G- G- Glacius. I mean they're Cuban, so the thing was a little different with defection and things like that. But those two obviously paid off really well. And if you go back even further, and I, uh, you know, Chad, you know a lot more maybe about the way things worked back then. But Tony Perez signed in 1960, and Dave Concepcion signed in 1967 from Cuba and Venezuela respectively. I mean, I mean, obviously it was very different back then, but those two guys were key cogs and uh, in the machine and, and certainly signing them and not having them be, you know, American born was a big deal. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Go ahead, Chad. Let it be known that I was not alive in the 1960s. So I, I know you suggest that I may know more about that. It's not because I witnessed it. Let me just, let's be clear here. Um, man, Seth. Attacking me already on my own show. I had the Clooney. I had the Clooney earlier, and I, I had to. I had to get it back even. I guess. I love. I it. guess. Yikes! It, it is pretty cool that it seems like the Reds, who used to be sort of panned league wide for their inability to um, uncover some of these gems compared to other clubs, are now considered one of the more savvy clubs in the international free agent market. So I love the business that they're doing down there. I just want to spot one guy. They drafted like, like fifteen dudes or something. They got a whole bunch of guys. Um, there's one fellow named Jose Sabino. He's a shortstop out of Venezuela. And some rumors are claiming that he may have been constructed in a lab using DNA from Jose Rio and Chris Sabo. So fortunately I got to protect my sources on that, but, uh, stay tuned for that guy. So Rex Specs and cigars. <laughs> That's it. He will immediately become my favorite player. Um, <laughs> the rest do have a few other guys that they've, uh, signed in recent years. Carlos Jorge is a guy that I'm really high on. Ricardo Cabrero, Alfredo Duno, who's probably the top catcher in the system. So they have been putting in a lot of time on these guys, and we'll see how it pans out. You know that we are a, we are a prospect pod, so stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to right. some actual major league news. Daniel Duarte traded to the Rangers for cash considerations. Chad, are you going to miss Daniel Duarte? Uh, no, I'm not going to miss Daniel Duarte, but I'm excited to see what kind of uh, talent uh, uh, Mr. Considerations has, cash considerations. I expect that he's uh, going to be uh, help the depth on this uh, on this club. So uh, I wish Daniel Duarte the best. I had, ne- had not thought of his name since the last time he came in a game. And I expect after today, I'll never think of his name again until I'm perusing baseball reference in about 10 years and trying to remember who's that guy. So. Godspeed, Daniel, Daniel be, Duarte. Uh, semi-obscure name that we lead off one of these episodes with here in a few yes. years. Um, Daniel was dfa to make room for Brent Suter. P.S. The more I look into it, the more excited I am about that Brent Suter signing. Like I think yeah. he's just going to be a real, real fun guy to watch. Um, it's not a big deal. Last year he had 31 and two-thirds innings pitched, had a 4.19 ERA. But the peripherals were even worse than that. He had a 6.16 uh, FIP. It's fielding independent pitching. So he was getting extremely lucky and still had a 4.19. So I think getting anything in return for him, even if it's just cash, is a decent bit of business. But I will mostly always remember Daniel Duarte for something that's going to uh, ring home with Seth quite a bit. He was the one that had a bit of an outburst whenever Ricky Karcher got the call to the major leagues. That's right. Instead of him. That's right. Which, That's right. Which That's right. is a very uncool. They don't have a category on baseball reference for uncool things done. But that was uncool. And it gave us all one of the best experiences of the 2023 season. Something that Seth actually got to witness live in Kansas City. I did. And I actually have a reference to it later when we talk about the outfielders. But I was at the Ricky Karcher game. Actually, we, we were just up at the top of the lower level at, you know, at Kauffman Stadium, a beautiful beautiful ballpark and you know, I said why don't we go on down there and, and see the post game and uh all of a sudden it was it was something <laughs> it was something I love it that's so cool you get to be there too um let's see what else that happened Red signed a guy it's a uh, Tyler Gilbert classic minor league deal with an invitation to spring training you know what last year all we had to get excited excited about were minor league deals with invitations to spring training so this being a, a little throwaway piece on an episode is pretty dope, but 
Tyler Gilbert, don't know a ton about him. Other than one famous piece of trivia, um, mm-hmm. Chad, do you, do you know why yeah. Tyler Gilbert? Pe- people might recognize the name. Well, perhaps because he, in his first uh, ever big league start, I think back in 2021 with the Diamondbacks, he actually threw a no-hitter, and, and some of you may remember that. So um, he has not thrown a no-hitter since, however. I, must, uh, <laughs> no I better hate that I report 2024. that. 2024. Yeah, right. It's time for get this get his second one. So yeah, you know he's a it's a it's a depth signing. He's gonna be thirty years old. He's not really distinguished himself after that. Um, but I don't know. That's an interesting piece of trivia. At least how many Reds pitchers on the roster this year have thrown a no hitter? Well, he's not on the roster yet. But in, how many Reds pitchers in camp have thrown a no hitter? We're gonna keep Just it out. One. See if he can, see if he can match Homer Bailey for number two. <laughs> All right, it looks like Jonathan India Watch is still ongoing. It's a panda watch and anchor man. We're gonna keep an eye on this one. Um, they submitted their figures. I don't know if we touched on the exact amounts last week or not, but um their arbitration dispute is happening sometime between January 29th and February 16th. Jonathan India filed for a four million dollar salary. The Reds filed at 3.2 million. And for those that don't know how that works, is both sides file a number, and then an arbitration panel will decide on one of the two numbers, not somewhere in the middle. So we'll see how that goes. The risk of these is often that you can really get some bad blood between club and player. But Nick Crawl had some comments this week saying that uh, this dispute is not adversarial. <laughs> Jonathan India was not quoted as a part of this piece. <laughs> um, said any thoughts on the ongoing Jonathan India versus the Reds? Well, I think for the most part, the Reds have done a good job of of settling these these cases the last few years. They used to go to arbitration quite a bit in in the old days. Um, but I don't even think if we would think 800k would be that big of a gap, except for the fact that we presume there might be already bad blood because of the trade rumors and those kind of things and the shifting around and um, people saying he might play the outfield, this, that, and the other. I don't know. I. I don't think it would normally be anything to be that crazy about, but the fact that we've got the situation here, I think that's adding to it. It may not be adversarial just yet, as Carl says, but when they get in that room and oh, the Reds yeah. have to make their case for why he doesn't uh, deserve that, it's going to be adversarial, let me just tell you. And it's a really interesting to me uh, what this says about what the Reds think about Jonathan Indy, because we're talking $800,000, which is a lot to, to you and me, but um, to Big League Ball Club, it's really not that it, that much for a guy who's been so celebrated as the leader of the team. You know, um, there were there were a lot of teams that for a guy that it, it, if Jonathan is as valuable as a lot of people think he is, a lot of Big League teams would have given him that money to avoid this process or at least uh, come uh, further in his direction. The fact that they couldn't agree and they're just that far apart, it does give you some indication of what the Reds think about India future in Cincinnati and just where he stands uh, on the depth chart. Yeah. could not agree more. The, uh, the question of how the Reds value him is interesting. And I guess that's a decent transition over to um, kind of considering how the rest of major league baseball and some of the other um, analysts and talking heads think about him because MLB network is doing a thing right now where they are sending out their rankings of positions across the MLB, they're ranking players top 10 based on position. And they've only had a couple leak out so far, but one of those was second base. And I thought pretty fantastic that our boy Matt McClain was listed number sixth after 80 some odd games in major league in baseball. They already picked him as the sixth best second baseman in the game. Notably missing from this list was Jonathan India. So when you're going in uh, trying to argue your value to a team, I can't imagine it helps your cause when you're sort of positionless. You're definitely not the best player on your own team at that position. Yeah, even the best players or the most beloved players that have gone had to go to arbitration, it, it gets nasty in there. So we'll have to see how it goes. But And certainly maybe we don't even hear about some of it. But, but yeah, I, I think there's a writing on the wall type situation there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to see. We'll get in, take this opportunity to get into our discussion on the uh, the Reds' outfield because there's a chance he could play a role there. 
and where he ends up, how they utilize him, or if they just kind of keep him on the sidelines as a depth piece is going to be a really interesting subplot to the rest of the season. Yeah. I mean, can I just mention one uh, other thing about that uh, list? And it's just, a, you know, it's some, some analysts. Here's, here's our list. But first of all, saying yeah. that McCarthy is Reynolds the sixth is best one of them, so. Exactly. So let's not take it too seriously. But yeah, McLean is uh, the sixth best second baseman according to this list in all of baseball, not just the National League, not just in Cincinnati, in all of baseball according to this list. And what's interesting to me is that um, Matt McLean only played 37 games at second base last year. Mm -hmm. He played almost twice as many at shortstop last year. So uh, I don't know about any of these. Uh, I think if people are just seeing the writing on the wall because Ellie's here or, or what, but uh, really, really kind of fascinating. If you want to, if you want to kind of read the tea leaves. Uh, I also think it's interesting that uh, they've, they've gone through a few of these, uh, not many of them yet, but I think they've done, uh, MLB has done the position lists for right fielders They've done, um, let's see, your short stops and I think catchers and starting pitchers. And so this is the fifth position that, that, that they've ranked the top 10. This time a Reds player has been named at any of those positions. So uh, it shows what, you know, uh, while, while we should continue to be excited about Matt McClain, it's a more evidence of that. But it's also, I don't know, um, I'm not sure what else it says. It says nothing. It's just dumb. Analyst well, they're often a year behind too, right? I mean, they they don't know about a guy enough. Like, would it be surprising if Noel V. Marte's on there next year for third base? I mean, we know about him, but but it's not everybody knows. And and Matt, Matt McClain just came up and did so well. So, yeah, that that's that's kind of it. That's one of those I see so many reasons to be excited about this team next year because I think so many guys are going to perform really really well. But the reality is. I'm a fan of this team. I am looking at it through those reds color glasses where I want to see these guys do well. And there's no world where they won't, but other people are going to have a little more tempered expectations. And I think you'll see that in a lot of the projections and um, you know what? Screw all of them. The reds are going to win 150 games. Best team ever, man. Only 150. Only 150. You know, you gotta be reasonable. Love, out there. It. Love it. If they don't win 150 games, however, there is a very good chance it is because they did not address one of the more obvious points of need in this offseason. And that was the outfield. I think that pretty much everybody you would talk to would say that either outfield or uh, an ace starting pitcher were the, were the two areas where the Reds most needed to improve. And what did they do? Nothing. They certainly didn't sign an outfielder. They didn't trade for an outfit. We can agree on that. I think there's an argument to be made that you can shuffle some pieces on the chessboard and the outfield could be improved last year. But let's first look at who Fangraphs thinks are, is going to get the uh, majority of the playing time out there. They think T.J. Friedel is going to be your starting center fielder and get a lot of playing time. They think that Spencer Steer and Will Benson – are probably going to be your other two main guys in the outfield. And then they've got a little Jake Fraley, a little Stuart Fairchild action coming at you. And I got to tell you what, Fangraph's not pumped about any of these guys. So let's start off with this. Chad, who do you see being, I won't say the opening day outfield because that could be matchup dependent, but who are the three outfielders you think are going to get the most time? Well, you know, Friedel uh, and Fangraphs is actually a little higher on Friedel than I am uh, in terms of their projections. Uh, but he had a great year last year. Friedel's going to be get the lion's share of the at bats in center field. You're going to get Spencer Steer. I think uh, what the uh, Jamer Candelario signing indicates is that Steer better uh, be working on his uh, his uh, fly ball roots out there. He's going to get a lot of the time. And then I don't know Fraley and Benson. Some uh, it's matchup dependent. It's Fraley and Benson. I think that's a a, a, a perfectly cromulent outfield, but it's uh, an outfield that has uh, not a lot of a track record. None of them have much of a track record, and and the only track record that some of them have, is, uh, when I, I'm thinking specifically about Fraley, is um, well a great beard number one and uh, getting injured. So. I, I, I got to tell you, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic about just about every part of this team. This is one place where, you know, I'm uh, the world's biggest Will Benson fan. Um, but, you know, I'm uh, I'm not selling his stock, but I'm not buying it either. I'm kind of I'm going to hold it. I'm going to 
you know, I need to see a little bit more from him. I think he's probably a guy that everybody gives David Bell uh, a lot of grief uh, for his uh, his matchups and his uh, platooning. But I think he might be a guy that uh, Bell's done a good job sort of hiding against pitchers that he has difficulty against, uh, lefties pr- uh, primarily. So I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I'm not enthused about this group, but all, but the, frankly, um, I, you know, I, I like all these guys, and uh, I think that there's some upside that, there. I don't know. That we'll get more out of Fraley than we got last year, or Friedel, but I think we get we'll, we could get more out of Steer. I think we could get more out of Benson potentially, and so is it going to be the best uh, outfield in the uh, in the division? No, I can't. I can't see that happening, but. Um, you don't have to squint too hard to see this outfield being relatively productive. Well, that just, I'm not happy with that answer. Can we re record that? <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's true. And it seems like Fangraphs kind of agrees with you. They project every single Reds outfielder. I say every single. What I did is I looked at the, uh, the five players for each team in the Central most likely to get the lion's share of the at bats or the innings. And they think every Red, that Friedel, Spe- uh, Steer, Benson, Fraley, and their fifth one's a little bit funny. We'll talk about that in a minute. To be worse than they were last year. Every returning major leaguer to be worse. Headlined by TJ Friedel, who had 4.4 fan graph wins above replacement last year. They're projecting him at 2.1 this year. And if they're higher on him than, Chad, you said you are, then you're expecting a pretty precipitous drop-off from TJ Friedel. Now, I definitely think there is a world where TJ Friedel uh, – had his best major league season ever last season. We might never see that again. That's why we were sort of banging the all-star drum as loud as we could, because it might be his only chance. I'm going to you know, stay optimistic that he can, if not reach those heights, stay somewhere in that vicinity. But, yeah, asking him to get 4.4 again is going to be tough. Spencer Steer I thought was a, a funny one, though. They also have him having um, just point one, but a, a worse season than last year. And I, this is the one I disagree with the most. I think that he is going to show improvement. I think having an everyday spot in left field is going to be huge for him. Um, Seth, how big are you on Spencer Steer going into this season? I'm huge on Spencer Steer, and I think he'll have a great season. My my problem as I look at it is, and and we talk about the matchups and things like that, you know, you could have against a right-handed pitcher an all-left-handed batting outfield of Fraley, Frito, and Benson. And, and that might be fine. Um, and Steer could work in there in the infield sometimes, or one of these guys could be a DH at, at given times. My concern beyond the the first four, I guess, is finding another right-handed bat or a switch hitting bat. And certainly Jose Barrero, I guess, played a lot of center field and r- some right field down in the Dominican Winter League. Maybe he has a great spring training, and, and we wheel that out there again to see if it works. I don't know. And then uh, Stuart Fairchild, uh, I saw C. Trent Rosecrans, and his first prediction of opening day lineup had Fairchild making the team. So I don't know. I'm not as enthused about the right-handed side of the plate overall, and, and that's what bothers me a little bit about this outfield. But but I think Steer, at, at worst, treads water. But at best, I mean, he he really got his his first chance out there. If you put him, he's going to be versatile. But if you put him out there in the outfield, about what 75 percent of the time he plays. He, he doesn't have to worry about bouncing around quite as much. So I, I see a lot of good things coming from Steer. You know, you kind of touched on one of the things that um, I have no reason to believe this is true other than that I just really want it to be true. When I said the Reds didn't make a move in the offseason, or did they, it was kind of like, does did that Candelario signing provide an opportunity for Christian Encarnacion Strand to mm-hmm. get regular playing time out in right field? The book on him seems to be that he's just going to be bad defensively everywhere. But a lot of really good major league teams have bad defensive corner outfielders that can absolutely mash. So I am, I'm hoping that that is a development we see. I think it answers a lot of this lineup flexibility problems. If you can get him regular bats out there. I just don't know if that's going to be the case. But one of the things I found most interesting about the fan graphs um, projections was the – the player they predicted to have the fourth most wins above replacement, only one behind Will Benson and two above Jake Fraley, none other than Blake Dunn, which is just kind of wild. This guy has never played above double A, I think. I'm not sure I mean, he actually exists. I've never heard of him. Is it? Is this a real player? 
He, I've heard he, of a different Dunn. He has a similar beard to Jake Fraley, so they might have just gotten them confused by looking at their picture. Um, if Blake Dunn, and if you want to, uh, you know, pick it, get, get very specific with your sliding scales, you can find reasons to get excited about this guy. But the fact is, he's a 25 year old player who's never gotten above double A. And despite being a uh, 20, 50 guy last year, one of only like five ever, I think, to be a 2050 guy in the minors. If he is one of the most productive outfitters on this team, that is a bad sign. I think that's a bad sign. So, um, those projections did not have CES or Jonathan India featuring in the outfield mix at all. Um, there's been a lot of talk about India being out there. So, that's interesting. Is there anybody else, any other names that y'all can think of that might get some ABs or at least meaningful playing time? Cody Bellinger. Oh, now we're talking. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, um, I don't want to see CES out there, uh, no. Christian and Carlos Strand. If we can avoid right. it, um, I hope. I hope he hits. I hope he mashes like uh, Nate is expecting. But I, I, I don't want to see him in the outfield. I'm not sure he can handle it. Um, uh, but uh, you know, if he's out there, it does increase the offensive capability potentially of that group. And uh, I, does. Is Jonathan India is I mean he, he's not going to hit enough to be a corner outfielder uh, and and can he play de- it defensively maybe um, but we don't know that so uh, you know I don't know there's a lot of there's a lot of ifs there's a lot of things to uh, again I talk about questions and things to watch this spring this is maybe uh, in, other than the uh, the health of the pitchers and how that's going to shake out this is probably the one of the maybe the biggest question to be answered this spring and. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of unknowns there. Hey Nate, one thing I wanted to highlight, Nick, it goes back to that uh, Ricky Karcher game. Um, I spent the the pregame in right field hoping Ellie would hit a home run to me in, in, in batting practice, and I got to talk to T.J. Hopkins' friend and dad or so, some relative of his, and and Hopkins was never going to be the guy for the Reds. I get that it wasn't like that, but it, the thing that highlighted for me was he got called up because they needed him right at the time. Um, but his friend was telling me, yeah, he's got a leg injury right now. He's he, he's one of the fastest players in the organization, but he's just not running well. And and it just highlights that you can't pick your you know the time when you get to come up because you know I'm sure he would rather have gotten his chance in the big leagues when he was fully healthy. But hey, I got to go when they call me up. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, when they brought him up, he was absolutely tearing the cover off the ball down in Louisville, and then really just didn't get many opportunities in the in the big leagues. Um, Another name that I think we could see at some point is uh, a fan of a lot of people listening to the show, Jacob Hurtabisi, center field prospect. Um, the guy hits for almost no power. I don't think he hit a single home run until like his last at bat of the 2022 season or something like that, something crazy. But the guy gets on base. Between um, Chattanooga and Louisville last year had a – I can't do the math uh, – 479 on base percentage. So somebody like that, they can play some defense, have some speed, might get a few at-bats. But like Chad said, there is some reason to be a little nervous about how this outfield is going to stack up, especially when you start looking at the other teams in the Central. Um, certainly no surprise to me. They predict the uh, Chicago Cubs to lead the Central and wins above replacement. Um, for reference, the Reds were predicted, predicted to have 8.2 wins above replacement. Out of their top five, they have the Cubs at 10.5. Um, I talked a lot about why I was big on the Reds starting rotation compared to the other teams because of the depth. They didn't have that you know, high-end talent necessarily, but they had a lot of pretty good guys or pretty solid, solid guys. That's sort of how the Chicago outfield looks. Um, they've got Ian Happ leading the team at 2.6 wins above replacement. Seiya Suzuki right there at 2.4, and then Christopher Morrell. And then between Pete Crow, Armstrong, and Mike Talkman, that's just like those are five dudes. They're not having the conversations about the the Blake Dunns, the Jacob Herdebeces. Can Jonathan India throw a ball far enough or hit? They've got guys up and down that lineup. And I think that we could look back on this season. If we end up missing out in the playoffs, we could look back and say this is the reason why. Um, Seth, we'll go to you next. Do you have any other teams in the country, any other guys that you are sort of targeting or worried about as a Reds fan? 
I mean, no, and Bellinger could still sign with the Cubs too. So he could be playing the outfield and kind of be in that anchor that they need. And of course, if Ian Happ doesn't get a play against the Reds at all this year, then he, his, his war will be at least <laughs> one or two points lower. That's a good but point. I, I'll be honest with you. You guys closed last week's episode, I think it was. And I think, Chad, you said something to the effect is, well, it's not going to be this way when we look at the outfielders. And, and that's not me saying that the Reds have a great outfield situation. But but my goodness, I wrote down the top three or four for all the all the central teams, and I just don't see. It. I mean, I know you're you're talking about some of these Cubs players, and some of them are more up and coming, even though they're a little more experienced than some of the guys we talk about with the Reds. But gone are the days when the NL Central's filled with teams with three or four outfielders that you're just scared of. I mean, put put Dunn, Griffey, and Kearns of 2005 out there for the Reds, and they'd have the best outfield by far. And and that wasn't even the best year for for Kearns, obviously. So I I don't know. I don't see the star power. I see Yelich as a star. If Bellinger comes back to the Cubs, he's a star. McCutcheon's kind of you know older now. Connor Joe is listed as one of the top Pirates outfielders. I mean, I I just don't see it. Jordan Walker's a, a guy up and coming for the Cardinals, obviously. But it's this is not this the the division is not full of great outfield talent. Yeah, I think that's a. I, I, let me just quickly. I think that's a that's actually a, a great point. Uh, I look at the other outfields and I see one star. Mm-hmm. I think Brian Reynolds is probably the only guy I would consider that's a star, true. and he plays for yep. Pittsburgh. Uh, there's a lot of good players, and other teams have more above average players, perhaps. But it's it's true. There are no like superstar outfielders in the National League Central. So I guess in comparison to our competitors, maybe the Reds having uh, uh, some question marks in the outfield. Is not going to hurt him as much? I think it's a fair point. Yeah, that is a good point. I do think you guys are sleeping on Lars Newt Bar because that yeah, is yeah. a fantastic <laughs> name. One of the all-time best names. Um, some other names to throw out there. Uh, we touched on Jordan Walker for St. Louis. The uh, projections are pretty funny. They think he's going to have an incredible offensive season because he is just a stallion in the batter's box. But that guy's defense is so bad. He's like negative eight runs <laughs> outs above average or something like that. Just ridiculous. Um Chad mentioned Brian Reynolds. Thankfully, we played a division, at least as we're comparing outfields, to Pittsburgh and Milwaukee. Because they think uh, <laughs> Sal Freelich, that guy who's been in the minors for forever, that he got all the fanfare last year because he finally got the call up, is going to be their best outfielder. They're going to rely a lot on people like him, Christian Yelich, who hasn't put a good full season together in a while, or great full season in a while compared to his name recognition. Jackson Churios is uh, a guy that they project to be their second best outfielder, and he's a prospect. So... I guess this is one of those scenarios where I'm just trying to not be too much of a homer because I look at this outfield and I see Will Benson and I see Jake Fraley and I start to get pumped up and I see TJ Friedel, but is it going to be enough? I don't know. And I'm excited to find out for comparison, by the way, last year, the uh, Cubs baseball reference has a funny go wins above average in their outfield rings. The Cubs were seventh overall. At 3.4, Seth brings up a good point. They don't have Cody Bellinger this year. Um, the Brewers were second. Reds were third with negative 0.3 ahead of the Cardinals and Pirates, who are garbage. Um, this year, Fangraphs has Chicago first, St. Louis second. The Reds third with a pretty big drop-off there, a two-win drop-off, followed by Pittsburgh and Milwaukee bringing up the rear. So let us know in the comments. Um, tweet at us. Tell us how you feel. Send us letters in the mail if you disagree and your thoughts. Please let us know how you, where you think the Reds stack up against their peers. Hey, one one other thing. On that same trip when I saw the Ricky Carter game, I was in St. Louis the day before, and Jordan Walker, you know, the Cardinals fans were trying to compare him to Ellie. Um, and Ellie was on that streak where he'd just come up, and and, and that was the – I forget the Cardinals game. He, he made it home on a, a diving play. Actually, that's what it was. It was, a, it was like a, a grounder to a drawn-in infield, and Ellie went home and slid. And a guy in front of me, he had been talking about how Walker was going to be as good or better than Ellie. And then he kind and, and I think Walker had a really big mistake that game too, Jordan Walker. And the guy turned to me and looked like, he's like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was nice to see a Cardinals fan eat some crow a little bit. Something that I like that I just realized is that you can use about five words to start describing an Ellie De La Cruz feat. And I'll just start smiling like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> like I know where you're going with it. It's going to be something incredible. And so pumped to watch that guy this season. All right. You guys want to get to some viewer mail questions to take this bad boy home? 
Let's do it. All right, Chad doesn't, so he's gone. See you later. <laughs> All right. As always, these are actual questions from actual viewers. Um, if you two want to uh, join that family, come hang out with us over at patreon.com slash riverfront. Cincy, we'd love to have you. First question comes from Hooper Pal. For those of you who would listen to the banana phone, whatever happened to the coach that used to call Marty and mispronounce all the players' names? Ch Chad, is this something that you might know? <laughs> This is actually, I don't, I don't remember this one. Now, if, for those of you who don't remember the banana phone or don't, don't know what the banana phone is, the banana phone was fantastic. Whenever the Reds would have a rain delay, uh, Marty Brenneman and Joe Nux all would pull out the uh, the banana phone and take uh, take calls. And sometimes it was uh, crazy. Sometimes it was uh, funny. Sometimes it was just odd. That's one I don't remember for some reason. Um, I remember mm -hmm. Adam from Milwaukee calling uh when, when adam dunn called up there yeah real um, quick if you have not listened to the uh the audio of adam dunn calling the banana phone just google adam dunn banana phone adam from milwaukee and enjoy the next 60 seconds of your life i remember earl scott hatterberg <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one i remember was earl from erlanger marty would always take his call mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I do remember. I do remember it. Yeah, no, but it was it was always it was always fun. But I don't I don't remember that. Uh, Seth, do you remember? I don't. I it's actually yesterday I was telling my thirteen year old son in the car about Joe Nuxall and and how as he got older he just refused to learn how to pronounce guys' names. And I remember uh, I remember Chad. Do you remember this? He he would Bobby Abreu because we were listening to a thing about his Hall of Fame candidacy. He could not say Abreu. He'd say Never. Abreu. Bobby a brew, Bobby a brew. <laughs> Every time. And, I mean, it was beloved. It was, it was like that kind of stuff. You know, if you're not a Reds fan, you don't get it. And actually I got in an argument one time with my student radio cohort. Cause we got in the car after the Ohio state spring game to go back to campus. And, um, and Joe was on the, the air calling a spring training game or an early season game. And, and my, my buddy, he's like, we're better than he is on the air. What's this all about? And I'm like, Hey, that's Joe Nuxall. You do not talk about Joe Nuxall. And I about got out of the car and just walked to him because, no, we're not doing that. If ever there was a good reason to get into a fight, that's it. <laughs> um, Hooper, I don't want to just leave you with a bunch of I don't knows for your questions. So um, I think he was a CIA plant. He was infiltrating, um, trying to get some inside info after the uh, the book Marge Shot Unleashed came out. Um, they needed somebody close to the situation. So he's now uh, working in, I don't know, Quantico or somewhere. Next question comes from Gary Hilliard. He says, does Ellie De La Cruz in center field make sense with the 2024 roster? Um, I'll bet lead off on this one. I think strongly that he does not in 2024. I can envision a future where he ends up out there. If some of these other guys come up and they're just better defensively, but I don't think that there's any way we see him get even an inning out there this year. Chad? I've gone on the record of saying he needs to play as many innings at shortstop as he can this year. Let's see what he let's see what he can do. Let's let him uh, let's let him improve. Let's let him get some some time there. You know, I always point back to um, Barry Larkin's early career at shortstop, and he was an error machine his first year and a half, two years uh, in the big leagues, and then of course became a Gold Glover and a Hall of Famer. Um, so I want to I want to see Ellie De La Cruz get a chance to really refine uh, his play at the big league level at that position, uh, you know, but uh, going back to our outfield discussion, you know, it, uh, if he, if he's in center field, it, uh, it, it changes the way I look at that outfield group a little bit, mm -hmm. but it also changes the way I look at the infield group. So, you know, um, six of one half dozen of the other, I hope not. And I actually, I don't see it actually happening in 2024. Um, stranger things have happened. True. Seth. No, I think you're right, and he's so young that you, you have to go see it. Now, here's the thing. At the end of the season when he wasn't hitting as well and he, he had some some mistakes as a, as a shortstop, the thing that gave me hope, I guess, was that Barry Larkin would identify what he was doing wrong almost immediately. And it wasn't that he was being overly critical, but but give me Barry Larkin and Ellie De La Cruz on a backfield in Arizona in Goodyear here in about a month, and and let's fix these things. And then let's go, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give you every opportunity this year to play shortstop, and we're gonna we're going to see how it goes, and we're, we're gonna we're gonna handle if you make some mistakes still because you're still so young. What he just turned twenty two, yeah. I mean, 
I, I think that's how you have to do it. Now, if in a year or two, if it's still not coming and we have a hole in center field, okay, let's let's go. But but I think this year, especially with some help here in spring training, because now Barry Larkin and the whole coaching staff knows exactly what they need to fix. Yeah, they've got the tape now. You just, you want to see progress. You want to see him improving, and it's important to remember that this guy, the book on him said that he had a plus-plus glove all the way through minor leagues. So he had some rough stretches last year. That's going to happen. Let's give him some time. All right, next question comes from Rich Thompson. He says, since it's been a slow news week for the Reds, shall we contemplate some UVA men's basketball? Chad has been known to do that on occasion. Um, which so far has brought you more joy this season? William and Mary defeating and defending UVA's honor by beating UMBC or UVA beating Virginia Tech on Wednesday night. Ouch. Well, what's, all right, the Rich. what's the relationship between UVA and UMBC? All right, all right. Okay. I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that someone can beat UMBC. I didn't. I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know it was possible. So, congratulations to the tribe of of William and Mary. Uh, I don't want to talk about UVA basketball this year. I mean, I think they're fine. They still have the greatest coach in the world, uh, but they're kind of. Tough to watch this year. Did get a big win over the uh, the the Chokies um, last night, so that was uh, that was good. But uh, so let's please let's move on. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rich. I don't <laughs> want to talk. I don't want to talk about UVA basketball right now. Rich, tune into uh, Riverfront U, where we also won't talk about UVA basketball, but there will be some college basketball talk for sure. All right, uh, Seth. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. You just want to keep moving on. I know where Please I was the there. night that that happened, but we won't talk it anymore. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, next question from Kyle Kapler. He says, I won an ace too, but what's one more move they can make to help this year's team? I assume this to mean something meaningful, not just around the edges. Seth, what are your thoughts on this one? I mean, they, they could still make a trade. They, they haven't made the trade, and certainly with Jonathan India and all the arbitration talk, we, we've gotten away from talking about whether they're going to deal them. Um, I, I know they love all the prospects, and, and, and we don't need to go down that road too deep again, but, but, but they could still make a trade and land a number two or three starter, maybe even a number one starter with a year of control or two years of control. Um, they could find that switch hitting or right-handed hitting outfielder in a trade as well. So it could still come. And I know Nick Crawl said he's pretty much done making moves, but have you ever heard a general manager go back on his word like that? So we'll see. Yeah, that's it. Chad, what do you think? Uh, I, a couple things. Uh, first of all, yeah, I think uh, there's a possibility to trade out there. And, you know, if the Reds – yeah, I want an ace. I absolutely want an ace. And I want the Reds to trade all the prospects too. I've gone on record as saying trade every prospect. I'm a little disappointed the Reds haven't traded any of those international signings uh, yet that, that they just made. <laughs> uh, just come on. Um, so, but you know, one thing I wouldn't mind seeing that, uh, might be a little more realistic and I don't know who the name is, but I would, I would actually love to see the rest get some kind of a number three guy that just is going to give me some innings, league average innings, a bunch of innings. I think that really moves the needle for this team in some ways. Um, it provides more depth and also, uh, you know, um, bolsters, it, it bolsters the, uh, the rotation. It's not like the guy we want. Yeah, just somebody that's going to go out there and throw a bunch of innings. What you know, not not a bunch of innings like we would have gotten twenty years ago, but for for twenty twenty four. The other thing that I would say here is it's really indisputable uh, that Kyle Kapler has a just glorious name. Sure. That is a just I've been wanting to say that every week. That is a great name, Kyle Kapler. Uh, you know, that's it. Just rolls off the tongue. I hope his oh. middle name doesn't start with a K. But, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, the names we know are, are pretty sweet. How hard do you throw, Kyle? Maybe they could they could add you into the bullpen mix. Because that's one thing that yeah. I would still love to see them do. Is I think that the Reds have put together a very – an improved and a deep bullpen. But we'll get into it a little bit next week. And uh, spoiler alert, I know less about other teams' bullpens than I know about anything in the world. <laughs> so it's gonna be a riveting conversation, no doubt. I have to bring in some, I have to bring in some, some, some hard guns on that one, some ringers. But I would like to see them get some, uh, just like some really high caliber arms out of the bullpen. They got a lot of guys that are going to be pretty good. Sort of those, the bullpen version of that number three guy Chad's talking about. But I think that there's still room to add a, a, one or two real impactful arms in that bullpen to shore things up in that seventh and eighth. Because Lex Diaz, we love him, but 
you know, if, if bull, bullpen arms are so volatile, if he has a down year, then suddenly it gets real scary in the late innings for this club. Hey, hey Chad, your point about the kind of middle of the rotation innings eater, I can't agree more because then that allows some of these younger guys, it takes the pressure off them a little bit, but it allows for a Hunter Green to shoot all the way up to not being a number one or two starter because there's just not as much pressure on him to carry the load as a whole. And Ashcraft, the same thing. Um, I think you're you're totally onto something there. It doesn't even have to be the splashiest move. It should just be, hey, give me 190 to 200 innings. Let's go. Yeah, I like it. All right, final question comes from James Urban. He said, just wanted to acknowledge the GOAT, Nick Saban, as I'm still shook up that he retired. Who do you think is the closest equivalent in the MLB in terms of success? Roll Tide forever, friends. Hmm. Now, does this imply that the person is still managing and could retire any moment and would have a similar effect? I don't know. Seth, anybody come to mind? I was just reading a little bit about John McGraw and, and uh, Connie Mack. I mean, the, the people that did it for years and years and years and years. I mean, the, the, the success that Nick Saban had, um, somebody tried to say that, that you know, Belichick was more a, a bigger winner or something like that. I don't, I don't know. He, Nick Saban went down there and just locked down the entire sport for the better part of, what, 15, 16 years here. And, and certainly as an Ohio State fan, I was happy to beat him in 2014, but but you didn't get that chance very often. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the guys, what one more games than Bear Bryant, which is pretty crazy. Chad, anybody jump out to you? Yeah, you know, when I think of this, I, I'm like you. I think there's two ways to look at it, all time or, you know, a current guy. Uh, the guy that jumps out to me is Joe McCarthy. I think uh, uh, Joe McCarthy won seven World Series with the Yankees, uh, you know, uh, Murderer's Row. Uh, well, he, he came, I guess, after Murderer's Row. Um, but he he, he uh, led the Cubs to the uh, World Series before he came to, to New York. And, yeah, he had Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Uh, and, and then he spanned to the era of Joe DiMaggio as well. So, uh, he, so he, had the, he had the horses. But, you know, what? Nick Saban's had the horses uh, at, uh, at Alabama as well. If we're talking um, a current guy, I mean, I think it's got to be Bruce Boshi, you know. Yeah. Um, that was who I had. has been in. Yeah, he's been in how many six World Series? He's won four, um, two different uh, organizations. I mean, Bruce Boshi's a, a legend, and uh, I'm not sure that people really understand it. Actually, I think he's been to the World Series with three different teams. Yeah, yep. right. Uh, the, the, the Padres and, and the Giants and the uh, and the Rangers this year. So, I mean, Bruce Boshi is one of the greatest managers in the history of this game. So uh, that that that's probably who I would say. Much like Nick Saban, left. <laughs> The uh, arena he was coaching multiple times. Bruce Bochy retired. Mm-hmm. Nick Saban went to the NFL to flounder. Can he be the GOAT if he was bad at his job once? Yeah, he can. Nick Saban. <laughs> Pretty good. All right. I think that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode of the Riverfront Red Show. Chad, uh, anything else going on with the Riverfront you feel like pointing out? Lots going on. Always something going on. Well, you already heard about uh, what uh, at Shanerbaum has going on. Uh, looking forward to that Scott Hatterberg uh, interview and uh, looking forward to the stories coming. You know, stories are I, I love the conversation that you all didn't let me get in on uh, earlier in the show about stories, because it's uh, it's my favorite thing about being a Reds fan, because uh, over the years we've had so little to actually cheer for on the field. But man, there's so many great stories. Um, I'm going to do uh, some shameless self-promotion before I uh, swing around the riverfront. But, you know, my 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 newsletter this week, uh, it's free. Chad Dawson dot com. Go subscribe. But. It was about what I thought was the, the wildest offseason in uh, in Reds history. And uh, I think a lot of people don't know this story And so because it was 1890. And <laughs> so I was, I was a wee lad of just four years old at the time. But um, the 1890-1891 uh, uh, offseason was insane. The Reds had three different owners. They were affiliated with three different leagues. It was just a, it was a different time. So. So, but so, so if you're not subscribed to that, why not? If you're also not subscribed to this YouTube channel, what are you, you're missing out? We are, as I checked before we started here, eight uh, subscribers away from a thousand. Get us over the top for crying out loud. I mean, it's been growing every week, but it just let's, let's put that behind us because what you're going to get there is you're going to get the Bengals show uh, with Joe and Greg. And, uh, you know, uh, those guys, that show gets better every single week. You got uh, late night Reds every Sunday night with Tim Daniel. Um, 
you have uh, the Red Leg Roundtable now. You got NBA Friday. You've got uh, the Riverfront U. I'm just, it's a, uh, it's just a, you know, the time to be part of uh, of the Riverfront. I'm really excited about the way this uh, this, this uh, team is growing, and that everybody that's come on board is way better than me at all of this, and that makes me very very happy. So cut. So, uh, but 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 ultimately, get us over a thousand, please. What are you all <laughs> waiting on? Yeah, it's an exciting time around here. We're pumped to be bringing um, coverage on just about every single Cincinnati area sport with FC Cincy coverage coming soon. Um, Xavier, Northern Kentucky, uh, Cincinnati uh, sports, obviously. Um, Seth, thank you so much for coming on, man. Um, we are really excited to get your Scott Hatterberg interview coming soon. Yeah, so everybody it's, stays it's, tuned for that. Um, Seth, please, uh, any, any parting words of wisdom, any thoughts you have, and also shout out your socials. Let it, let people know where to find you. Well, as Chad said, it's at Shaner bomb at Twitter and Instagram. And, and I'm pretty active at both. And, and certainly I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to be on here with you guys because, uh, going back to red Lake nation radio, this has been a part of, of my, le- my week, my week, every week for, for several years. So I really appreciate it. New of, of you, Chad, even back on Twitter, even before I listened, but uh, just re- really thankful to be a part of you guys. Yeah, we're, we're thrilled to have you, Miss. So thank you for joining the family and uh, for pumping out some awesome content. And that's going to do it. So uh, thank you to everyone for listening and supporting the Riverfront. Please tell your friends, tell your family, tell your family to tell their friends, and that's how we get over the hump. Um, subscribe all the places, like us all the places. We'd sure appreciate it. And once again, the biggest shout-out to our family over at patreon.com slash Riverfront Cincy, who keep this ship afloat. Love y'all. So, shout out to Adam Dunn. Shouts to Lisa Alberto and Wayne Krenchicki and Eli Cash. For Seth Shaner, for Chad Dotson, and Eddie Tobinsey. This is Nate Dotson saying so long, Cincinnati. <laughs>